joining us as uh, we uh, begin to uh, to uh, uh, launch into our uh, 2021 uh, annual general meeting. Uh, thanks uh, everyone uh, for joining us. And as of uh, 5:30 or so, we had about 350 plus people signed on. So uh, that's uh, that's wonderful. It's a beautiful night out, and I know uh, sitting out in the deck may be a little bit more appealing than uh, being in front of a computer. But we certainly appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, I'd like to turn things over to uh, our president, uh, Rob Hare, uh, to officially kick things off. And uh, and uh, by the way, my name is Angelo Lombardo. I'm the uh, OFH's uh, executive director. So I'll turn things over to our president, Rob Hare, for some opening remarks, and then we'll get right into this evening's agenda. Thank you, Angelo. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm really happy that you people have chosen to join us from the comfort of your own home. Uh, based on the stay at home orders by the Ontario government, I think this is an opportunity for you to engage with OFAH, as I said, and Angelo said, to, you know, for the comfort of your own home and possibly on your own back deck. And hopefully we can enlighten you with a lot of stuff that the OFH does and what we do on behalf of anglers, hunters and trappers throughout uh, the province of Ontario. And, and in some cases, our reach is further than that in Canada. So it's really important that, uh, that you're here. Thank you very much for doing that. There's a great numbers of people and I, I'm really happy to see our guest speaker is with us tonight too. So that's really, really comforting. So to kick things off, the first thing I would like to do, and this has been a bit of a tradition for with me for quite some time now, is I would like to observe a moment of silence for the anglers and hunters who are no longer with us to share the comfort of a campfire. And in particular, I want to, re I want to acknowledge, excuse me, Fred Gebert, who passed away from uh, on December the 15th, who is a past member of the Board of Directors and a chair of the Fisheries Advisory Committee. Gord Trelinski, who passed away in January 17th of 2021, was a longtime board member and chair of OFAH Zone E. Rick Morgan, and we all know Rick Morgan, uh, passed away on February the 3rd, 2021. Rick was the former executive vice president of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the host of the Angler and Hunter television series. And Jim Etherington passed away on March the 30th, 2021. Jim was a past OFAH Zone G board member. So if you would please join me at a moment of silence and reflection for those members who are not able to share the warmth of the campfire with us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you would please join me in reciting the conservation pledge. I give my pledge as a Canadian to save and faithfully defend from waste the natural resources of my country, its soils and minerals, its air, water, forests, and wildlife. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce our, our, um, our guest speaker, the Honourable John Yakubowski. John Yakubowski is the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. He was first elected as an MPP for Renfrew, Nipissing, uh, Pembroke in 2003 and was re-elected in 2007, 2011, 2014 and 2018. He was raised in politics as his father, Paul Yakubowski, served as the MPP for Renfrew South for 24 years. Formerly a real estate sales representative, the minister is best known locally as a former owner operator of Yakubowski's Home Hardware in Berries Bay, which he ran for 20 years. Mr. Yakubowski is also known for a record of community service including the Royal Canadian Legion, Madawaska Valley Lions Club and Boy Scouts. As well, he sat on the steering committee of the, of, of the Capital Equipment Campaign for St. Francis Memorial Hospital 
and he's very active in his church, St. John's Lutheran Augustburg. In 2010, Mr. Yakubowski recorded and released his second CD, Taking Care, to raise funds for nine local long-term care homes. His first CD, To Your Health, raised over $50,000 for five local hospitals in Renfrew County. Mr. Yakubowski grew up in a family of 14 children. That's uh, just about enough for its quorum in itself. And he and his wife, Vicki, have four children and 11 grandchildren. Please welcome Minister of Natural Resources, John Yakubowski and OFH Executive Director, Angelo Lombardo, as they have an informal discussion on issues and topics that are of importance to our members and the outdoor community. Well, thank you, Rob. And uh, again, welcome Minister, it's great to, uh, to have you here. I know that uh, you have Good a very, very hectic workload and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, having a discussion with you uh, uh, this evening. So again, uh, thank you. We certainly appreciate it. And as I mentioned earlier, we have quite the crowd with us tonight. Uh, there's about 350 plus people joining us. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. That's certainly wonderful. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't know, uh, we just uh, got off a cabinet meeting that, uh, started at two and was supposed to end at four and it ended at uh, quarter to seven. <laughs> well, um, I, I know that uh, you uh, haven't had much to do over the course of uh, the last uh, 12 yeah, months or so. At all. <laughs> so uh, certainly, so thank you. So you know what, Minister, I'd like to sort of um, uh, kick things off and just ask a, a little bit about you and something that I've often thought about. And, and quite frankly, sometimes it, it, it's sort of um, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, I'll use the word annoying to me, but you know what, we have lawyers that often serve as attorney generals. We have doctors uh, that serve as ministers of health. But to be honest with you, it's been a long, long time since we've had uh, an angler and hunter serve as a minister of natural resources. I know you're an angler hunter. I read uh, the interview that you did recently with our folks from Ontario uh, Outer Doors magazine. But why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, your upbringing, and uh, how you feel that that has um, you know, positioned you uh, for the job and the role that you play within uh, Ontario's government? Well, thank, thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Angelo, and, and thank you to Rob for the uh, introduction. And I do want to uh, say that uh, I uh, had many uh, interactions with uh, Gord Trelinsky over the years, and, uh, and we, we certainly do miss him. And uh, that's just something that, you know, every year you're going to face that, uh, that reality that some of your uh, brothers and sisters in this organization will no longer be with us. But... Um, I, I do want to, you know, say what a, an honor it is for me to uh, to be part of this uh, this evening. Uh, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters is a tremendous partner with uh, with my ministry, and part of your. I, I just saw the tail end of uh, the presentation before I before we got on, and um, you know the number of different things where uh, many of them at the um, um, you know sort of the. Uh, uh, beginning or, or be the uh, encouragement of the Ontario Federation Ang Ang Anglers and Hunters uh, programs that we've started uh, in the Ministry of Natural Resources over the years and many that we've partnered on as well so it's it's great to be here to uh, you know to address your members well you know so to do your uh, to your initial uh, question or not really a question I suppose it's just kind of almost like who the hell are you right <laughs> who are you let's, let's hear a little bit well, you know, I mean, we, uh, I'm a guy from rural Ontario. So, you know, when you, when you're growing up in rural Ontario for all, of, and, I, and I'm not picking on those that don't grow up in rural Ontario, but it's just a kind of a natural thing here that uh, you can't wait till you get your first pellet gun or BB gun or something. And uh, sometimes uh, you're not much taller than the length of that, uh, that uh, uh, weapon uh, by the time you get it, because it's uh, as a, uh, as a guy boy growing up in rural Ontario, you just expect that that's what you're going to get because you've had the opportunity to be out with your dad or an older brother. In many cases, uh, I, I recognize that you know it's it's not it's not gender specific, uh, but growing up in a, a family of ten boys, uh, it was more likely to be around an older brother. But um, so it's an interest that that you grow up with, and you know I I, I, I can still remember catching my first fish. You know the I, 
I, I wasn't even sure there was a fish on there because it really was, it was a little foreign, the, the sensation, but it was up at Stopas Creek, which is down the railroad tracks from our house and on a bamboo, uh, bamboo fishing rod, you know, with my dad. And you know, I mean, I was as, just as uh, proud as, as if I'd, uh, you know, nailed a 40 pound lake trout or something, you know, so it was quite, uh, quite the experience. Now, I have to say that I don't get to experience that uh, as often as, uh, as I might like anymore. And, but uh, my family certainly, uh, our kids are very active. Uh, um, one of our granddaughters, she's just, um, so 97, she's just, she's going to turn 14 this year. She was born in 97, so she's going to, uh, or not, 20, 2007. So she's going to turn 14 this year. She's already uh, been successful twice in the in the deer hunting. One 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 with a rifle and one with a bow, and uh, so she's uh, she's uh, doing very well. Now her dad, our oldest Zachary, I, I have no idea how many how many uh, uh, deer he might have uh, shot over the years because I, I wouldn't be able to count them. But very successful, and and they and they you know they 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 uh, they. Uh, cook that meat in so many different ways. And uh, Zachary's a tremendous uh, uh, at preparing uh, venison. So they make, they make use of all that. So it's kind of what, you know, I, I don't think I'm unique uh, in, in the area I live. In fact, I'd probably be one of the ones that would be on the, the lower scale of, uh, of uh, hunting times and opportunities for some of the folks here, because I know when, you know, when I was growing up, we basically, uh, you could pretty well shut the high school down uh, for the two weeks of deer season here because everybody was gone, uh, uh, gone deer hunting. So that's part of, part of our, uh, our, our upbringing. And, uh, uh, I'm very pleased that, you know, had the opportunity to be the, uh, become the minister of natural resources because, uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I, I come from a, an area that is very, very much outdoorsy and, uh, fishing and hunting oriented, but also, uh, very involved in the, in the forestry business. So the two, uh, two of the more the key um, items in my ministry um, are very, very much part of my my upbringing. So it makes my job a lot easier, I think, but also makes it uh, more enjoyable when you can have some victories, so to speak. Well, well, that, well, well that's a great minister, and uh, I know our members want to uh, start to, and discuss some some of the topics and some of the issues that uh, we have uh, been dealing with uh, over the course of time but I, I really did did think and do think that it's extremely important that uh, everyone understands um, you know who you are and uh, what makes you tick uh, and quite frankly uh, from an organizational standpoint uh, when we get together and we have those discussions it means a lot to us knowing that we can cut right to the chase and start talking about the issues at hand as opposed to explaining what the issues are and you and you certainly and you certainly uh, get that and uh, to your point about uh, shutting the high school down uh, during the uh, deer hunt they didn't shut my high school down I just didn't go so I can relate to that but anyways, it's a pretty special time of year. And, um, you know, the outdoors is a pretty special thing. And uh, living live in the outdoors and being part of it uh, certainly is a benefit to me and my job. And uh, as you uh, mentioned, it certainly is uh, to you in, in your position. But I think what I'd like to what I'd like to do is I'd like to switch gears a little bit. And I want to talk about something that's been before uh, all of us for, you know, the better part of 13 months now. And it's uh, this thing called a pandemic. And uh, as uh, we all know, it continues to uh, impact almost every aspect of our lives. Uh, as of today, we're facing uh, yet another uh, stay at home order that will last right through the opening of the spring turkey season, uh, the bear season, as well as overlap with many spring fishing seasons, including trout openers in Southern Ontario. Um, we're hearing already from many of our members. A lot of them have joined us here uh, this evening from right across the province. And uh, they're wondering, um, you know, if the stay at home order, um, you know, how will, how will it affect uh, fishing and hunting? And what advice is the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, giving to uh, anglers and hunters during this difficult time? Yeah, that, that's a great question, uh, Angelo. And, 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 and absolutely, I mean, everybody's been seized one way or another on this, uh, this pandemic, and, and there's nobody that has escaped uh, the impact of it. Uh, certainly many people wouldn't be uh, not necessarily be impacted directly, but somebody they know or heard of, but their lives have been impacted either uh, in the in the way that they uh, conduct their own uh, business uh, as part of their employment. 
and or their enjoyment, uh, which uh, for many uh, hunting and fishing is, is such a huge part of that. It's not, it's not our plan, uh, not our uh, intention uh, to, um, um, you know, change the, uh, the, the openings for any of our seasons. We didn't do it last year and we don't plan to do it this year. Um, we recognize, you know, hunting and fishing, uh, you know, one of the good things is, is it's, it's conducted outdoors. Right. And, and uh, you know, so I know it's a kind of a, con, a contradiction sometimes uh, because we, yeah, we have a stay at home order. And that is, you know, to, because we, we want people to be, we don't want people to be congregating as, uh, uh, as much as possible. We want them not to be uh, together uh, outside of their own, uh, their own uh, circle of bubble, so to speak, but outside is a little different. And, um, you know, we, we are, at the same time, we're encouraging people to, because we're, we're allowing outdoor activities such as uh, golfing, uh, ski hills that are still open, are open, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so we, on one hand, we want people to take advantage of the outdoors. It's extremely the best place to be, uh, the le least likely place that you're going to contract or transmit um, the COVID-19 virus. And also it's, uh, it's uh, massively important for people's uh, social well-being and mental health. So we don't, we're not planning to, to change any of those uh, opening season dates. Uh, it all comes down at the end of the day, um, Angelo, and I say this, uh, you know, uh, with the greatest of, of optimism, but also recognizing the tremendous challenges that we have and are facing, it really comes down to uh, vaccinations and how, uh, you know, we're certainly in Canada where we haven't, uh, we just haven't met the numbers, for example, that the United Kingdom and the United States have have made. So you see the changes that are already taking place in those uh, countries uh, with regards to what's being allowed and not being allowed. Uh, and we need, we need to, uh, you know, get uh, a whole lot more advanced uh, in the area of vaccinations. Uh, but we're hoping that this, this next 28 days or approximately that uh, length of time will allow us to, um, to make that kind of progress in vaccinations so that, you know, when, when we get back, you know, last year, the fall hunt, well, we didn't make changes. We were very clear about, you know, the the number that could be in a hunt camp, et cetera, et cetera, and that kind of thing. And we're, you know, I'm I'm very hopeful that when the fall season, which, you know, is still the biggest one from a particip participation point of view, um, uh, that that we're back uh, to where we were in 2019. Well, that's that that's that's certainly good news, uh, Minister. Obviously, um, being given the opportunity to uh, hunt and fish uh, during this pandemic has uh, been a huge benefit to us all. Obviously, it helps with our, our uh, physical and, and mental well-being. We, we know that uh, we still have to uh, participate in these uh, activities, taking public health guidelines into uh, consideration. Um, you know, we worked, um, you know, very closely with uh, your government to, uh, uh, to uh, stress the importance of keeping fishing and hunting seasons open, open uh, taking public health guidelines into consideration. And uh, we certainly give uh, your government um, uh, the necessary kudos uh, for doing that. Just a question, did, was it ever discussed? Did you ever feel that, um, you know, that we had to shut down uh, fishing and hunting during this pandemic in order to keep people safe? Or, or was that never really thought about? That, that was not a discussion uh, at this juncture, but it most certainly was a discussion um, in the spring of, uh, of 2020. Uh, when this when this first hit, uh, because you know we had to really go through the whole gamut of activities, uh, both uh, employment related, uh, industry related, every single thing, not just recreation, but every uh, single activity uh, that you know contributes to people's lifestyles and our economy, and and certainly it was a a point of discussion at that uh, at that time. But I'm very I'm very thankful. And grateful for the the input that I received from you and your membership, uh, because uh, you know it, it's it's important to have that when you're having these discussions to know that uh, that there's there's a great strong organizations out there that are are, are making it clear that they, they believe and that was one of the things uh, they felt very clearly <clears throat> very clear people you know in the not just in the, the individual. 
anglers and hunters, but also those that you know make their living in the business, felt that we could conduct these activities in a safe manner, respecting the protocols. And I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that's that is one thing. Yes, we're not going to change these uh, the the uh, dates, etc. But we still want people to make sure that Absolutely. they are doing this safely, and it can be done safely. Uh, we showed that last spring, and we believe we can show that again. Oh, that's great. And uh, as uh, most of our uh, members in the outdoor community know that uh, we are the uh, hub of information when it comes to um, uh, COVID and how it relates and pertains to those outdoor pursuits. And we have many vehicles that we communicate with our members. So through our website, social media, as uh, things uh, become available, announcements are made. I encourage our membership in the outdoor community to uh, visit our websites and uh, we'll do our best to keep things updated, uh, keeping um, the um, uh, public health guidelines uh, in mind as well. Um, Minister, you recently announced uh, the support for resource-based tourism by waiving fees. Uh, I participated, as you know, on the uh, ministerial ad uh, advisory uh, panel on hunting, fishing, and uh, resource-based tourism. Uh, the borders are still closed and uh, limit traditional clientele for some operators, which is obvious. And uh, we have been advocating uh, the government to invest in the promotion of domestic uh, uh, opportunities uh, to bring more people into the fishing and, and hunting uh, fold. That would help drive uh, tourism with safe outdoor activities. And we all know that the tourism industry has uh, taken a, a big uh, big hit on the chin uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, is this something that uh, you believe uh, can be done? Well, you know, it, it's it's not without its challenges because I mean, the those that, uh, you know, came from across the border um, were a huge component from the financial aspect of it because, you know, uh, that was the you know the biggest uh, source of clientele for many of the outfitters um, you know here in the province of Ontario, particularly in the north. So losing them uh, you know last year and and at this point we're not sure about this year. So we have extended or re-upped you might say um, our um, support for uh, resource-based tourism by. Uh, waiving those fees again for the, for the for 2021 because we don't know when those borders might get reopened and it may you know even if they do sometime during this calendar year uh, it may be too late you know for you know if you're if you're an American planning your your year uh, you're already already planning your hunting uh, trip up uh, to northern Ontario for moose or bear or whatever the case may be um, so so the, the, the prospect of them coming back this year is, is not one that I'm, that I'm overly positive about. We wanna be positive, but we, we have to be realistic as well. But in the meantime, you know, we brought forth a, a program for you know, tours, uh, you know, kind of um, traveling tour, tourism in Ontario. And there's no question, right. Angelo, when you mentioned the tourism sector, there's no, there's no sector that was hit harder, whether it's resource-based or, or what 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 uh, you know others might consider tourism, which is just you know traveling and seeing the sights, so to speak, and whatnot. But because tourism is something that is great to do if you have the opportunity, it's not like groceries or uh, lumber or things like that that are absolutely necessary to do things. So it was it was not one of the hardest. I would suggest it was the hardest hit uh, in in the province of Ontario. So we've recognized that, and and we've got a um, a tax credit for people who travel within Ontario uh, in 2021, uh, which uh, we're hoping obviously right now it's uh, it's not going to be any uh, of any use with a stay at home order because right now we've got a crisis on our hands. Uh, but we do see a light at the end of that tunnel and, and we want to encourage people to to spend that time in the province of Ontario. And that might, you know, it might just trigger some somebody goes to a fishing lodge this summer that they have never uh, on something they haven't done. They might say, man, that was that was one of the best damn, you know, five days or a week or whatever that we ever spent. We're going to make this uh, a part of our uh, part of our vacation uh, itinerary uh, from here on in. Maybe it'll be a different lodge somewhere else, but they might, you know, they they it might. We're hoping that it uh, plants a seed uh, for an activity that you know you and I understand how how pleasurable it can be. But if somebody's never experienced it, uh, they might uh, it might be something that geez, I really didn't understand how, how much fun this could be. So we're hoping that, and I, I know that there's a, a contest, uh, I don't have all the details, but the, the lodges are, are 
involved in a contest too, where you can win um, a, um, a vacation at uh, one of these uh, North, Northern Tourism Outfitters. Uh, so we're hoping, you know, that uh, it just starts to, you know, plant those seeds in a whole new uh, group of people that maybe haven't uh, taken, taken advantage of uh, the natural resources that we do have. To this well, that, well, well, that's great. As you and I know, we have some wonderful fishing and hunting opportunities in the province of Ontario, and we certainly want to encourage Ontarians to, to stay and shop local, if you will. So whatever we can do to continue to promote um, staying in Ontario when the conditions are, are right and people can travel, um, I believe that that's a, that's a win-win for us all. So um, I guess uh, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, your government has remained busy on natural resource issues. Um, uh, uh, many of uh, the issues that uh, you've tackled have been longstanding priorities uh, for our organization. And last year, was, there was the first ever cormorant hunt. Positive changes to falconry uh, and multiple lines for fishing for carp um, were recently announced. Action on wild pig. Uh, big changes to uh, moose management, and I thank uh, ministry staff for participating in a virtual uh, uh, meeting earlier uh, la or late last month uh, to address that and answer a, a lot of questions. Our members uh, certainly uh, appreciated that opportunity. Um, but uh, during your time as minister, there's been a couple of big things that uh, that are, are monumental uh, for the outdoor community and uh, particularly for the OFH. And I'd like to um, start with uh, the spring bear hunt. Uh, and I can't help but uh, uh, remind myself that, um, you know, what the atmosphere and what the feeling was back in 1999. I was working here at the OFH at the time in a different capacity, but I remember when that announcement uh, came down. And I know that uh, last year, uh, your government um, decided to fully uh, return the hunt uh, after the pilot uh, had been running since 2014. As I mentioned, this was a, a priority for our organization for over two decades. Uh, and uh, it really did leave us with a sense of satisfaction knowing that all our hard work and advocacy advocacy had uh, paid off to uh, bring this hunt back. So I, I guess my question is, after fighting for decades, we know how contentious this topic may be, and uh, it's still contentious uh, to this day. Uh, the facts were ignored by uh, government uh, for many years, uh, and in um, perhaps maybe your words, um, can you tell us why it was important for the government to, uh, to right this wrong? Well, I wasn't uh, around in uh, 99. I was certainly around, but I wasn't uh, in government. But I ran for the first time uh, in 2003, as uh, Rob would have articulated in the, uh, the uh, little biography there. And you know, uh, Angelo, when I was campaigning and in my riding, uh, you know, we, we have bear hunters. And uh, well, our, our son is uh, also, uh, both, of our son, both of our sons have, uh, have bagged bear. I, I've never shot a bear, I have to be honest with you there. But um, I'd still have an opportunity. But uh, I've shot the bull. People say I've shot the bull a lot. <laughs> but, uh, so, and when I was campaigning, I, I heard that a lot in my uh, travels, in my riding uh, about this, the, the cancellation of the spring bear hunt and how it was uh, done uh, not on, uh, on, on science, but political science. and and that there wasn't a justification for it. It was political pressure that had been applied uh, to the, uh, the government uh, back in 1999, uh, going into the 99 campaign uh, for, uh, for the Harris government. And I remember you know, saying to a, a fellow who was a bear guide at the time, I said, Percy, I will tell you this. If I ever have the opportunity or I'm in a position and I will, can I will, stand i will um advocate for this and i think if you look at my uh legislative record uh and my hansard record in the uh in the legislature i spoke on it more than more than a few times about uh my support for the return of the spring bear hunt but i said to percy uh, bresenhan at that time i said percy if i'm ever in a position uh to uh to change this i'm going to do what i can to change it now, you have, also, I have to tell you that it's the more time that passes, uh, you know, and the world keeps changing and there's, there's a whole new generation of people who are opposed to hunting. You know, every time, every, every new generation, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of, you know, pre, uh, um, people that adopt a different philosophy than you and I may have, right? So 
I was uh, certainly personally uh, committed to it uh, and uh, felt that we, we needed to uh, establish it, reestablish it based on, on the real facts. And I got to tell you, I mean, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters was a key uh, source of that kind of information, that, 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 that uh, real information that you need to have, right? You got it because if you're just taking it off the, off your head, it's, it's uh, when you're, when you're challenged, you can't back it. But um, I, I know uh, it was Mark, was Mark Rickman involved in that too? Uh, yes, I was yes. to, yeah. Who was, uh, but, but um, you guys were, a, were a tremendous source of, of, of support and information. And I know even, uh, and, and not just, my the, the government I'm a part of, but the previous government too was you were certainly making it clear that uh, there was a justified case for a return of a spring bear hunt, and not just a pilot. So uh, that was something that uh, I was uh, personally committed to, and I was very pleased when my uh, cabinet colleagues uh, supported uh, supported me on that uh, on that issue. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And we've always been for uh, science-based uh, resource management. And um, obviously uh, the discussions um, that uh, our staff had uh, with your staff to get us to uh, where we uh, are today is uh, certainly a, a huge thing to be, uh, to be proud of and a, and a celebration that um, you know, uh, we'll all uh, enjoy, um, particularly those that will, will participate in uh, our spring bear hunting season, which starts uh, just in a, in a few short weeks. For us, it, it was more than just a cancellation uh, of uh, uh, the spring bear hunt it was what the what the message actually meant or what actually could mean in in, in the future so um, all those years of uh, hard work and uh, lobbying and uh, uh, the the millions or hundreds of pieces of correspondence that uh, floated out of this office uh, to your office and other uh, other offices about uh, the hunt we're certainly glad that we got to where we are today and uh, um, I'm I'm, I'm proud to be an OFH member and I'm proud to be a bear hunter that the uh, spring opportunity is once again before us. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, glad to do it. Yeah, I know that the right thing to do. Well, that's, that's, that's the way we felt, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago. And uh, sometimes um, there's things worth fighting for. And uh, we certainly were, we're not going to give up the fight on a spring bear hunt. So that's great. So another thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, and it's something that we have been working uh, hard on for, for many, many years. And uh, I know that you were part of our conference in 2019, but it's uh, the topic of chronic wasting disease. Um, you know, um, we brought in uh, many experts uh, back in 2019. We hosted a, a conference. Uh, we met with uh, many stakeholders groups uh, across many disciplines to discuss the issue and find a path forward. And I said, some of the recommendations that uh, uh, were in the conference report have been picked up by uh, your ministry and enacted. Uh, in addition to the conference, there have been, um, uh, we have been um, uh, raising the profile of the threat of chronic wasting disease in Ontario and advocating uh, for more government action obviously to keep it out because it would be a, a huge uh, detriment to um, you know service populations uh, in Ontario. Uh, we want to think that uh, it was a direct result of our uh, advocacy uh, and the conference we hosted but we know um, the positive case in Quebec uh, not far from our border was a big wake-up call for uh, for all of Ontario. Uh, can you talk about the factors that uh, led perhaps to uh, the government to tackle this issue in a way that it hadn't done uh, before or for decades quite honestly? Yeah, you know, um, of course, I mean, it's not something that I would have um, had, you know, I'd heard about it, I knew about it, um, but it, it wasn't, you know, the spring bear hunt was something that was on the agenda as, a, as an MPP in opposition. Chronic wasting disease was not uh, from, a, from a political point of view. So we, it's not like we had a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time debating uh, that issue. So I really, I mean, I knew about it as a hunter. I mean, my, you know, we, we, it was certainly something that people were made aware of uh, from the ministry and through your organization and others uh, about, the, uh, about the concerns. But I, it was really not until I really became the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry where it was clearly, uh, you know, square out right there in front of me just how big a threat this could be as to because of what it has has done in other jurisdictions and 
particularly jurisdictions that bordered the province of Ontario. And you're 100 percent right when you say it was the you know the case in Quebec. It was like a bang, right? Uh, you know, slap upside the head. Wake up, boys and girls. This is uh, this is right on uh, right on uh, right on your uh, your doorstep. So I, I, th I think that uh, well, there's no question that that was a, a catalyst. But it is uh, it's also uh, you know the the input from your organization and others about what this would do to you know, the, the, the population, I mean, uh, if the population is not healthy, you're not going to have a, uh, you know, a success, you're not going to have good hunting, right? I mean, you're going to have a, a depleted and, and, and uh, sick uh, population. It's, it's not going to be the kind of uh, activity that people are going to be, and maybe, you know, may, you may even have to change a lot of the rules and, and um, certainly the harvest, because if it's found in areas uh, you know, there's many, many measures would have to be taken. So it's something that we've become a lot more active on in, uh, you know, right now we have not had a case in Ontario, but we're on the, and our partners, like every every hunter out there and every group is aware of it. We are watching and, 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 and getting input. And I know there was, um, you know, a, um, very much, uh, you know, more, uh, intensive surveys done in parts of the provinces this year where we're getting more and uh, we get more um, um, you know heads from the uh, the public uh, from the hunters to make sure that we're doing those those tests to check it out uh, I had the opportunity to be uh, in in Peterborough there um, at uh, Trent where where we had the you know the trailer set up where they were doing the testing uh, for the uh, um, CWD and and those are all of the all of the things that you know we're active on. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know we don't have uh, fences around the borders, uh, so we that's why we have to be uh, so d diligent and and always have an eye out. Uh, if it if there's something happens, we want to step on it real quick because uh, this can spread. Uh, you know, if any spread at all is not is not welcome, but it can spread faster than. Uh, then you think then you think if if you're not uh, being on the lookout for it you know right i know um one of the things that our organization have is, has has uh, been pushing for 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 many many years is the uh, elimination of uh, servant and ser servant farming servant farms with compensation uh to those that are, are currently involved in that industry uh, has there been any discussion or is your ministry prepared to uh, move forward with that recommendation can you share some insight on that to, uh, for us we did include, and we um, we recently amended uh, regulations. I have to take a look at this because uh, I want to make sure I have it right. But you know, we we've uh, included the expanded pro prohibitions on the import and the movement of live servants and servant parts uh, as one uh, one thing. Um, I'm not. Um, I don't think we have. You know, we're working with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs because on the on the domestic side of it, they're a big uh, a big part of it. Um, but I, I I'm not a hundred percent. It's not something that obviously we encourage, but I'm I don't know that we have a prohibition on it at, at this point. Well, well, obviously you, you you're... probably you probably know better than I do whether we have a, a prohibition on 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 uh, I. I I, I, I'm not sure that we uh, um, license new ones or anything, or do, or MAFR does either. Well, I, I know that your government sure. has, has clearly um, taken some action on the issue, and uh, we're starting to see some of the benefits. Um, as uh, as you can imagine, there's still lots of work to do, and uh, we're hopeful that um, your ministry, working with organizations such as the OFH, can uh, implement some, some processes and policy that will keep CW uh, Ontario CWD free. So that's obviously a priority for our organization, and uh, we're certainly willing to work with uh, you and your government to ensure that happens. And we want to keep, uh, you know, uh, stay engaged with with you folks because, uh, you know, we have uh, we have staff uh, in the ministry throughout the province, uh, but that pales in uh, comparison to the number of feet on the ground uh, from people like uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and hunters in general uh, that we rely on for uh, not only their uh, information but their cooperation and their partnership because. It's in all our best interest to make sure that things like CWD are uh, controlled, uh, prevented, uh, 
uh, stopped from getting here in the first place. But if that ever happens, then we're ready to uh, step on it quickly. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So um, we talked about uh, issues where the government has made some uh, significant progress, but there's always a long list of uh, priorities. Uh, <laughs> we have a we, we have a long list of uh, priorities, Minister. As you, there's know, always more we, to be done, Angela. There's, well, always, there's more always more to be done. Always more to be done, and uh, you know we have a, a pretty big shopping list that uh, we continue to you know thankfully scratch things off. But for everything we scratch off, we always add. There's something. there's a so, new one comes up on the bottom. Yeah, there sure is. There sure is. So I want to spend a little time about talking an issue that uh, we haven't seen uh, some progress yet and perhaps you can shed some light and the topic is conservation officers and uh, I recently sent uh, you a uh, you know but hiring more conservation officers was an election promise made by uh, uh, this government uh, to date we haven't seen any progress on achieving this commitment um, we we uh, the OFH uh, we've always been advocating for more uh, officers uh, across the province um, and uh, not only more officers, but uh, perhaps uh, the ministry uh, finding ways to retain experienced officers who seem to be moving on to other ministries. And uh, as I mentioned, we certainly, uh, we recently uh, sent you a letter on this topic and I wonder if uh, you can comment on that. And uh, perhaps uh, if I can ask, uh, is, is, is this going to be a government priority and you're gonna follow through on the promise that was made a few years back? Great, uh, great uh, question, and, and I always like to get letters from you, Angelo. Um, <laughs> I trust it. I, tr I trust it helps uh, fill up your recycle bin. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> um, listen, that's that's a commitment that uh, we made in the campaign. Uh, Premier Ford made that com commitment. I've echoed that commitment as the uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. And, and I gotta tell you, I've had the opportunity to engage uh, with conservation officers across the province, not, not as much obviously in the last year, but prior to that, and prior to, prior to being, being becoming a, a minister as an MPP as well. But th that is a first class group of, uh, of individuals that, that work tremendously hard, uh, a very small number managing uh, their responsibilities across this massive province. I, let, let me put it this way. I can't um, uh, give you an absolute specific other than I will tell you this, that is my commitment. I guess this is absolute, but I'm not going to, I can't tell <laughs> you that that is my commitment and it will be fulfilled under my mandate as Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. That you can take to the bank. Well, Minister, we certainly uh, appreciate that. I know there's a lot of folks out there that are, are celebrating that announcement. Uh, CEOs, as that's you mentioned. That's not an announcement. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's, that's a reiteration of a promise, Angela. Oh, I sort of tried to... Okay, you got me on that one. You got me on that one. Anyways, uh, no, we certainly uh, appreciate uh, your, your comments and uh, to your to your earlier comments, they are a pretty special group of uh, men and women uh, that uh, are out there day in and day out and work tirelessly to protect our natural resources. And uh, we can certainly use uh, more of them. Um, we have uh, we we have a, a you know great uh, a, a, an abundance of wonderful fishing and hunting opportunities, and we want to make sure that uh, those opportunities uh, continue for generations to come so so thank you for that so uh, just a just a question for you so um when you talk to the premier and your cabinet colleagues about the role that fishing and hunting can play in a pandemic uh, recovery um what do you tell them what do you say like what's the general consensus what's the feeling well i, th I think one of the things it's it's one of the activities that we still can we've shown that we can conduct it safely uh we can't bring people over the border we recognize that so uh, some of the uh, impacts uh, will not will not be the same <clears throat> but it but the economic impacts of hunting and fishing are huge to this to the province so there's a lot of businesses that rely on the continuance of angling and hunting and and because there's because there's uh, you know the spin-offs i mean the equipment uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the fishing tackle, uh, the bait, the, uh, the 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 truck that you you know you got to got if you got to have a boat you got to have a truck to pull it and all of this kind of stuff the impacts on the economy are are huge so we we've got the economic impacts but 
you know, my, my dad used to fish every Sunday afternoon and every Wednesday afternoon till he got into politics. In, in, in those days, uh, the retail stores were closed in Barry's Bay on Wednesday afternoon. So he would go fishing on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, one of my brothers who uh, was, was fortunate to have a job that gave him a lot of leeway, he, he spent you know, half his life in Algonquin Park. So the, the impact of that, when I say that from the point of view of your personal uh, enjoyment and your mental health and everything else, because you know, fishing is one of those things that uh, you can participate all by yourself or with someone, whatever you choose, whatever the choice may be. But, it, but it's, it's one thing that, that brings you a tremendous deal of satisfaction. And I, God, I gotta say for most people, it certainly must teach them patience as well. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things that, that, that those activities do for people, I don't think can be, be undersold. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not like uh, maybe some, somebody knows those fish and holes where they're that good, but you know, where you drop it in at the, uh, the trout pond and cast it in and pull it out, cast it in and pull it out. No, I mean, you can be hours and hours out there uh, and, and, and not get a bite, but still think, man, that was a great day. You know, it's being out there in nature, uh, you know, close to the earth and all of that kind of thing. And that did me so much good. And I, I'm not speaking necessarily, I'm, I'm speaking of people in general. So the, the, the impacts of that activity and, you know, uh, for hunting in general, I mean, you know, partridge hunting, uh, we used to do it, you know, sometimes by ourselves, but I go with my dad, uh, partridge hunting, uh, you know, as a young lad. But, you know, deer hunting, we have always done that as, as a group. So then there's that activity that you've got that bonding. It, 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 can, be, it can be family members, but it can also be those friends that, uh, that you get to spend that, that time with as well. So I think, you know, the, the, the benefits on an individual basis, everyone can speak to that, you know, for themselves. But we, can, we can't understate also the impacts that it has on our economy. I mean, when you got a place like Renfrew County, uh, we got we got businesses that depend on on uh, you know uh, outdoor sports like hunting and fishing. Uh, they, they, that's that's what their stock and trade is. So absolutely, the, I think the the impacts uh, you know are are, are there uh, for anybody who wants to um, you know open their eyes and and, and see. Oh, that's that's uh, totally totally agree. And uh, your earlier comments about um, you know fishing and hunting, um, having to try your patience. Uh, you know what? Uh, not being successful um, uh, puts me at ease. Um, and I'm not going to be popular by uh, by this comment. But golf tries my patience. I'd rather be fishing <laughs> and hunting than spending a day on the golf course. But uh, different strokes, no pun intended, for different tro uh, for different folks. I just want to back up for a moment, Minister, if I may. Uh, and I want to talk a, a bit about uh, training and trialing areas. Uh, and I apologize, I, I skipped over that but for decades as you know our, our members in the sporting dog community at large have been expressing concern at the dwindling availability of training and trialing areas for hunting dogs due to uh, the prohibitive wording in the uh, wildlife and captivity regulation under the fish and wildlife conservation act uh, new facilities uh, won't be licensed and existing licenses uh, can't be transferred which unfortunately will lead to the eventual elimination of uh, these areas in ontario uh, as you know, uh, the benefits of training and trialing areas for uh, training, testing, and exercising hunting dogs, as well as the uh, spin-off uh, to the economic benefits, and as you just mentioned, the economic benefits of hunting uh, have become enema, uh, evident. And um, uh, we, we uh, wrote you, I believe it was uh, uh, last fall, to ask your government to make changes that will allow for new licenses and the transfer of licenses. Um, is this something that uh, your, your government uh, will consider taking action on? Uh, absolutely, Angelo. It's, uh, it's, it is uh, something that uh, I'm engaged in presently. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, we, we did make those changes to uh, falconry. Um, and and, and, and I, I want to be clear, these are not easy things to do. Um, they're, they're politically very difficult to do. Um, because there's an awful large segment of the population who sees those activities as being unfair, unkind uh, to, uh, to animals. 
um, which which you know when you're in government you 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 have to um, be aware of the impacts of every decision that you make. Uh, you're going to make some you make you will make some people happy or you may make some people happy, but you also may or will make some people very angry. And <clears throat> the reality in politics is that angry people are far more motive motivated than happy people. <laughs> Uh, and I think I think we'll agree 100% on that one. Uh, I can't I can't I can't believe you have people uh, that get mad at you at a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, Nobody ever gets mad at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you just keep believing that. <laughs> um, so, but we are we are uh, looking at um, uh, offering some uh, some help uh, in this regard. Uh, I know I've been working closely with uh, with the folks, and my staff have uh, brought forth some uh, some things we um, haven't finalized it at this point. Uh, but uh, but we do uh, feel uh, it will be at least a, a clear a step in the in the right direction. Uh, because I mean, if people are you know you, you, you we're going to have hunting, and we're going to have people that employ dogs uh, as part of that a part of that activity and from my point of view is are we not better off uh, if those dogs are well trained and well prepared for the task at hand um, from my point of view uh, that, that would be a yes uh, I mean there will be people who are very uh, you know have a great uh, obedient uh, natural uh, hunting dog uh, and they may not avail themselves of that training, um, but, but we also, you know, run the risk of having people that have little or no training uh, of the dogs, and the dogs are really not properly prepared uh, for the task at hand. So, but if we don't have anybody out there who is capable of doing that, uh, then we have no dogs that are trained properly for hunting. So uh, I, I expect that uh, we will have. Um, some good news on that uh, on that file yet to come. I haven't. Uh, it's still uh, it's still an active one on my on my desk. Oh, great! Uh, thank you for that. So, Minister, being mindful of your time, uh, we we certainly uh, appreciate uh, you taking time out of your uh, hectic schedule to uh, join us. But um, is there anything, uh, Minister, that uh, you would like to highlight uh, to our members at this uh, at this time? Well, I, I, I think you, you kind of did it uh, yourself. Uh, I, we, you know, we, when we came into government, when I became the, the minister, I wanted to have a, because um, you know, in this business, Angelo, you never know how long you're going to be the minister. <laughs> <laughs> and it isn't necessarily um, because your government changes. Um, it's it's the, the, the need of the needs of the government uh, may change. And uh, you may have somebody occupy the office that you held that that doesn't feel the same way that you do mm -hmm. so i wanted to and and you know it's it's you'd like to be able to snap your fingers and get everything done right away um but it isn't it isn't as easy as that i know somebody might say well yeah we well, are the minister you just have to just tell them just do it um i wish it was that simple sometimes yeah, here. but uh you know i did come there with a commitment to see a lot of progress and a lot of changes uh, that would uh, be viewed positively uh, by the uh, angling and hunting community, and I think we've done that. Uh, and I say the uh, the job is is not yet done, and I'm still here, so <laughs> that's 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 a good thing from my point of view. Yeah. Uh, so I think we still have some opportunities to uh, um, to um, what did you say, Che? tick a couple more of those things off the list that you were uh, yeah, check, there. Check, check, check a few things off the bucket list but when you check them yeah. off we always add a few yeah more I, know, I know i know it's, we it's, always add a few will, more the list will always have the same number yeah, of items absolutely it. it just, just becomes new ones i i realize that uh, as as a father of uh, and a grandfather of 11 i i totally understand how that list uh, yeah. never gets small it just yeah. changes but well, you know so there there is things that uh, we still have uh, left in that list and uh, that we want to um, continue to make that progress on uh, be before, um, you know, before our, our mandate expires. Now, I don't know, I, 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 I notice on this thing on my screen, I don't know if I, you have it, but I see a Q and A icon or whatever you call that at the bottom. 
is there some questions that I, I need to be looking at there or you have been monitoring those questions? Uh, we, we have our staff uh, in the back oh. end monitoring the questions. Uh, we've been dealing with them. If there's things that are specific to uh, some of your comments, we'll make sure our folks get them to, uh, to you and your staff and um, you can, you can um, uh, respond to those uh, as, you feel, uh, as you see fit. Perfect. Right. So, you know, Minister, um, uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we have, uh, over the years, uh, formed a, a great working uh, relationship with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. You have my commitment, you have our staff, uh, my staff's commitment to continue to uh, work with uh, you and uh, your ministry to do everything that's necessary to ensure we have sustainable fish and wildlife populations, while at the same time uh, in enhancing, um, you know, angling and hunting opportunities uh, when uh, those opportunities uh, present themselves. Uh, you have wonderful staff, and uh, we've uh, we've certainly enjoyed uh, working with them, and uh, we uh, we certainly look forward to a future discussion. Some of the discussions, obviously, as you know, aren't uh, are easy discussions but uh, in some of the discussions uh, um, quite uh, frankly we have to agree to disagree on things and you know and, and you know that uh, it happens but uh, at the end of the day um, you know our, our main focus our goal is uh, making sure that uh, we have a good sustainable resource and uh, that we can continue in uh, to enhance fishing and hunting opportunities in this province so with that minister I know uh, you're extremely busy I want to so once again uh, thank you uh, I, um, you know send best wishes to you and uh, your staff to, to stay safe and uh, healthy through these uh, very challenging times and um, uh, as you know we're always here to uh, to chat and work uh, with you on uh, files of uh, mutual interest. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Angelo. And I, I, and I know we've had uh, many uh, conversations and I, I just thought of something as, uh, as you're winding, uh, winding up because you and I have always had uh, an open, and I'm looking over my shoulder and it's not, it's not just symbolic, but you and I have an open door policy. I mean, if you need to uh, get in touch with me, you know, my door is always open and you've extended the same uh, to me as well. So that, uh, that we keep that line of communication uh, open uh, to both of us. So yes, and it's impossible that we're going to agree on everything, but at least we're open to discuss uh, right. any matters uh, that, uh, that your organization feels are pertinent, uh, that my ministry has, a, uh, has, a, has involvement in. And we're gonna keep, uh, keep that line of communication open because that's the best way to find answers that are in the best interest of, of, it, of everyone involved. So thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to, to join you this evening. It's a pleasure. Thanks again, Minister. We members appreciate as well. your time. Thank you. Thank you to all the members out there uh, uh, on, the, on the call. Thanks, Minister. Appreciate it. You take care. All right. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Well, uh, again, uh, we thank the minister for taking the time, and uh, I'd now uh, like to uh, turn things over to our president, Rob Hare, um, and uh, he'll uh, he'll run us through his uh, president summary. Thanks, Angel. And it, it really was a pleasure to have the minister join us tonight. I know he's very busy, and uh, I think that his chat was very informative, and at the same time, uh, it was also candid. So it was very good. Thank you. Um, so. The OFEH tackles a wide variety of issues every year to dive deep into uh, issues and inform dis discussions. The, the Federation has several advisory committees made up of a mix of OFEH board of directors and OFEH members with relevant expertise to meet on a regular basis. The OFEH benefits from the committee expertise that includes anglers, hunters, former government resource managers and enforcement officers, scientists, and industry experts. The discussions and input from our advisory committees help the OFH establish a position and act on important issues. Mm. Um, I want to prov provide you with some of the 2020 uh, discussions that were held, and I feel that we'll offer an overview of the how the Federation works. The OFAH Fisheries Advisory Committee, chaired by Peter Sword, has a Fisheries Management Zone Council roundtable at each meeting where reports from OFAH representatives are shared and discussed. In 2020, 
Those discussions included proposed changes to lake trout regulations and FMZ-6, fisheries management plan for FMZ-15 and proposed changes to the bass season and FMZ-20 to name a few. The committee also engaged in Transport Canada's proposals for pleasure craft licensing and operator competency program and the MNRF proposal to increase set fines and establish new ticketable offenses. The committee was pleased to see MNRF implemented many of their recommendations on proposals for multi lines for common carp and rules around chumming and will continue to discuss how the province could consolidate standardized multiple line regulations on the Great Lakes. <clears throat> the FM or the OFAH Big Game Advisory Committee is chaired by Neil Weens, spending a considerable amount of time discussing bear management, including the government's proposal to fully return the spring bear hunt and changes to the black bear hunt on the Bruce Peninsula. Moose continues to be a common topic with discussions about possible communication effort to help hunters navigate the significant changes coming, as well as the recommendation, the OFAH sent a letter to the minister on the importance of moose aerial inventories. Other topics were discussed included deer seasons and harvest planning, the Bancroft North Hastings elk herd, chronic wasting disease re regulations, and the committee also uh, worked with OFH Small Game Migratory Bird Wetland Advisory Committee, who's chaired by Maya Besteo, to discuss the restrictions around the use of centerfire rifles and shotgun loads over a certain size for wolf and coyote hunting during the big game season. The recommendations from the Joint Committee were discussed and shared with the MNRF and I'm happy to say the regulations were amended to remove unnecessary restrictions. So kudos to the committee for doing that. The small game advise, the small game migratory bird wetland advisory committee also discussed potential, uh, potentially expanding the hunting opportunities to re reflect the prevalence prevalence of wild turkeys, including a, a proposal for a fall hunt in MNU 72 and the rising numbers on Manitoulin Island, as well the need to review the aging Ontario wild turkey management plan. The committee welcomed an MNRF proposal to expand opportunities for falconry that they had supported in 2019. And they were encouraged that some of their discussed concerns were addressed by MNRF to, to scope the first ever cormorant season that opened in 2020. The committee continues to discuss and pursue migratory bird hunting opportunities, most notably the establishment of a sandhill crane season in Southern Ontario. The Sporting Dog Advisory Committee, chaired by Dr. Joe Wilson, finalized a code of conduct for hunting with dogs pamphlet. And it was distributed to all conservation officers across Ontario to share with hunters using dogs. The committee continues to discuss the importance of training and trialing areas with a letter being sent to the minister. And we discussed that just a few minutes ago with the minister as well as issues related to hunters being charged for trespassing when their dogs cross property boundary lines. The OFAH sent a letter to the township of Duro Drummer regarding their proposed dog bylaw. And the proposed section of that bylaw was removed. So kudos to that too, that's great work. The OFAH Agricultural Advisory Committee chaired by Kerry Coleman discusses the intersection between farming and agriculture and the interests of anglers, hunters, and trappers. In 2020, the committee focused on an important priorities of the OFAH like 
wild pigs, and chronic wasting disease to discuss how the profile of these issues can be enhanced in agricultural communities. The committee also tackled the agricultural specific topics like habitat creation on farms and staying engaged in human wildlife conflict discussions related to crop and livestock depredation. The OFAH Recreational Shooting Hunter Education Advisory Committee chaired by Bill Blackwell, spent a considerable amount of time discussing the government's prohibition on thousands of firearms by an order in council, including, the very, including a very polarized perspectives of the OFAH members on the issue. The committee also discussed concerns about uh, possession and acquisition license renewals, backlogs uh, that were due to the pandemic and the potential that municipalities will be empowered to ban handguns. The committee members stayed current, or stay current, I should say, with, with municipal bylaws issues like discharge of firearms bylaws and Sunday, Sunday gun hunting. On the hunter education front, the pandemic induced a swift shift, I should say, induced a shift to use the, the Saskatchewan online hunter education course resulting in several questions and concerns that were discussed by the committee. The OFAH, uh, in, um, the OFAH in Indigenous Relations Liaison Committee, chaired by Dan Elliott, remained focused on exploring ways to establish stronger working relationships and collaboration with First Nations communities related to fishing and wildlife conservation. The committee also continues to follow up on relevant and potentially precedent setting legal actions, social movements, as well as dis discuss the ongoing land and harvest claims in Ontario and across Canada to help the OFAH maintain an informed position. I have only been able to scratch the surface of what the OFAH has been involved in for 2020 and only focus on the key topics of our committees. Your federation worked hard on these and other issues to remain the leader in fish and wildlife conservation. Fishing and hunting promotion and the advocacy in Ontario and across the country. And Angelo will uh, provide some of the highlights on, on details that were achieved in 2020. So Angelo, back to you. Thanks, Rob. Um... And again, thanks everyone for, um, uh, for being here with us. So just over a year ago, uh, OFH operations uh, changed drastically. We started working from home, video conferencing uh, became commonplace and we were forced to find a new normal. The new normal was anything but routine. Uh, during the past year, our corporate pendulum has been swinging between coping uh, and adjusting uh, to the chaos of the daily uh, change in global, Canadian, and provincial realities of a pandemic and how that affects our operations. We not only needed to completely transition our operations outside the office, but we also needed to resolve the issues created by the many plans that we already had set in motion. Our new normal uh, did not include traditions such as the Toronto Sportsman Show or face-to-face -face annual general meeting, it didn't include summer camps, conferences, or many of the plans that we had already laid out for the year. Our new normal also was clouded with uncertainty. Uncertainty about how long COVID-19 conditions would last, uncertainty about what was acceptable for OFH to do and not to do uh, during these challenging times. Uh, uncertainty about what post-pandemic landscape would look like for our members, our partners, for the outdoor community and industry as a whole. Uncertainty about how much of the new normal would transition back to the old normal. But most importantly, it was uncertainty about how the OFH would position itself to be successful during and after the COVID crisis. The world is ever-changing. But pre-COVID uh, evolution of our business landscape seemed glacial compared to the seemingly overnight cha uh, changes that we faced and will continue to experience in the foreseeable future. What will the economic picture look like once COVID-19 is finally behind us and how will it affect us here at OFAH? Our traditional members and donors may not be there, not because 
they don't want to be there, but because they can't afford to be here. Our traditional partnerships may not be there, not because they don't want to be, because they can't afford to be. The outlook and forecasts have changed so uh, dramatically due to unforeseen circumstances, and there wasn't a darn thing we can do about it. This isn't raising the white flag, and it's simply an acknowledgement that we need to do things different to thrive under the new normal. And as an organization, we certainly did that. And we really, really did. There were things, however, that were completely within our control. And that is what we focused on. We turned over some new stones as well as took advantage of every opportunity that we could. We didn't simply weather the storm and hope for the return of what we knew and felt comfortable with. We got comfortable being uncomfortable and embraced the change around us to the greatest degree possible. And we found the, relevant, the, the relevance that was needed for success. Despite these very challenging times, I'm pleased to advise that the OFAH has adapted and we've been able to not only persevere through the challenges, but also pile up many notable accomplishments in 2020. And that's something that I'm proud of, uh, our staff are proud of, and uh, you as members should be all proud of as well. Online engagement on all fronts has always been a priority for our organization, but even more so now as we continue to deal with our current environment. We have experienced great success in areas such as online raffles and lotteries, OFH branded products through the OFH Pro Shop, online memberships, which are continuously breaking records, auto renewals that uh, are receiving a great traction with many members embracing this option. We have been talking about online engagement as an important thing for many years, but we have often referred to new strategies and possibilities as the future of the OFH business. Online engagement and revenue uh, are not uh, going to become an increasing part of OFH business. It's OFH business right now, and we will continue, uh, and it will continue to be for long after, uh, once the quarantine has been lifted. Right now, we're being forced to put all our eggs into the online basket, and from all uh, indications, it's working. We're facing unprecedented and uncertain times for fishing and hunting, which has created an opportunity to position the OFAH as an essential part of the ongoing conversation. As I mentioned a moment ago, online membership renewal numbers continue to rise. We closed out 2020 at just shy of 70, 77,000 members. These numbers are very respectable indeed, but they are down from our organizational high of 84,000 set back in 2014. For the most part, our acquisition of new members is good, but we continuously ask ourselves what is needed to, to retain members long-term. This will certainly continue to be a priority for us in the weeks, months, and years to come. Throughout 2020, the OFH established itself as a vital source of important information for anglers and hunters when it came uh, to their need uh, for the interest in COVID-related news that had the potential to affect their outdoor pursuits. Our COVID-related uh, web pages generated more than 560,000 page views between March and December. Collectively, across all OFH websites, we had 1.3 million page views. Our members continue to tell us that our advocacy efforts, conservation programs, and being the hub of information as it pertains to fishing and hunting and conservation are still top priorities in their mind for our organization. Despite not having face-to-face -face options available, the OFH continued to provide a strong, credible, and pro uh, professional voice for anglers and hunters, and we did so at all levels of governments, uh, municipal, provincial, and federally. In 2020, we had the opportunity to work directly with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks to participate in virtual ministerial advisory consultations on economic and societal impacts of COVID-19. Our participation on both councils was the basis of a June letter to Premier Ford highlighting our understanding of the financial strain that this pandemic has caused and the coordinated effort required to dig ourselves out of this fiscal hole. We reminded the Premier that uh, by the time uh, this, uh, these pandemic related restrictions are lifted, the province would likely be facing the highest deficit in its history. Economic recovery will carry harnessing the power of every sector, including outdoors, recreation, tourism, provincial parks, conservation resorts, natural resources, and infrastructure. We propose that modern government investment would create jobs and give economic stimulus in the outdoor sector uh, while generating such needed conservation benefits for Ontario's natural resources that can be sustained long term. 
In 2020, we continue to work hard to create a positive image for fishing, hunting, and trapping through the fifth uh, annual OFH-led Camo Day. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, this annual face-to-face -face, uh, engagement and celebration that takes place in schools, places of business, et cetera, reached over a half a million people virtually. In 2020, our fishing and hunting outreach programs took on a much different look as face-to-face -face interaction was not possible for most or all of 2020. Unfortunately, the Excuse me, unfortunately, the OFH Mario Cordellucci Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center has been closed to the public since March uh, of 2020 and remains closed. Despite this, staff have worked diligently to transition most programs to a virtual experience. We will continue to share our conservation message with school groups and the general public. With respect to our tackle share program, only 15 of its 140 loaner sites participated in 2020 due to COVID restrictions. But despite these restrictions, the National, the National Archery and the Schools Program did manage to certify four new schools, bringing the provincial numbers to 146. NASP is delivered by 600 basic archery instructor trainers um, across the province. The OFH administered hunter education program was not immune to uh, COVID restriction, but we still managed to train a very respectable 14,833 students, 4,023 of those chose the online option. And OFH conservation programs continue to operate despite the challenges of COVID. In 2020, the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program concluded uh, phase three which uh, was 2016 to 2020. And we began preparing for phase uh, four, which will take us from 2021 to 2025. Approximately 540,000 Atlantic salmon were stocked into Lake Ontario tributaries. Three planting projects were completed, two on Bronte Creek and one on Duffins, thanks to funding provided by TD Friends of the Environment Foundation and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. The classroom hatchery program adapted on the fly to successfully release almost every school's fish in the spring of 2020 and plans were made uh, to deliver the 2021 program at only a few select locations so that we can share the experience remotely with a 15 week video series. The OFH delivered Alice uh, Peterborough program helped to convert um, just over uh, 69 acres of marginal farmland into functional ecosystems, which are helping to create wildlife habitat, purify water, assist pollinators, protect biodiversity and mitigate climate change. The Community Hatchery Program, a partnership with Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, raised uh, 843,847 fish that were stocked into public waters in 2020. The program provided $150,000 in funding support to 32 community hatcheries across the province. In 2020, we also were fortunate to renew our transfer payment agreement with MNRF that will see us uh, assisting in the delivery of this program until 2023. For the 29th year, in partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Invading Species Awareness Program continued to build support for conservation by connecting with anglers and hunters and all outdoor enthusiasts to engage them in invasive species preventative action. ISAP made over 1.6 million impressions on people participating in activities through which invasive species are introduced and are spread, empowering people and communities to help protect our environment economy and society from invasives. In 2020, ISAP also received two Trillium Foundation grants to assist with uh, classroom education. That program has been put on hiatus until fall, uh, as well uh, as assist our clean, dry, uh, clean drain and dry programs that educate uh, and provide boaters with best practices on how to stop the spread of invasive species by the boating community. In 2020, along with partner support, the OFH continue to find ways to invest in the future in fish and wildlife research and management. We, uh, we awarded three different research grants uh, worth $4,000 each to support student research. And shortly, I will have the pleasure to introduce you to uh, the students that were awarded these grants in 2021. As well, um, we're pleased to offer two fish and wildlife conservation internships with the support of BrokerLink and Fitzsimmons Financial Group. These internships and other work experience opportunities with post-secondary institution allow the OFH to provide early career opportunities by working with their fish and wildlife professionals on a range of policy and conservation uh, programs. 
We continue uh, to experience fantastic open and click-through rates on our email content and the list of active emails we reached with issue and policy-related content grew close to 60,000, representing approximately 12,000 more than we had in 2019. In 2020, we released a new OFH uh, e-newsletter, the OFH Insider, uh, that we sent out on a regular basis to report on policy and other fish and wildlife issues, profiled Ontario Out of Doors content, Angler and Hunter television happenings, OFH program work, fundraising efforts, as well as other items of interest to those who enjoy the outdoors. The OFH is accessible through all forms of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Ontario at Adores uh, magazine continued to uh, be the go-to source for everything fishing and hunting, not only for our members, but the outdoor community as a whole. Our digital subscriptions continue to grow with more choosing either a paperless membership or all access, which includes both digital and paper versions. Angler and Hunter Television celebrated its 27th year and continued to highlight the many benefits of fishing and hunting in Ontario, as well as across Canada. You can tune in on City TV, the Sportsman Channel, or stream on, on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Our message reached millions of viewers 24-7, 365 days a year. Thanks to some of North America's largest manufacturers of premium products for making NHTV possible. We must also acknowledge our many corporate partners who support OFH programs and activities, as well as offer benefits to OFH members. Some of these partners also have strong affinity programs with the OFH, and in 2020, they contributed over $70,000 to our worthwhile conservation initiatives. Affinity partners include the Bank of Montreal, BrokerLink, Manulife, Marks, PV Mark, formerly TSC, and The Brick. Not only do OFH members get special discounts and incentives through many of these programs, but it also results in significant contributions that support OFH efforts each and every day. And as I've said uh, once before, and I'll continue to say it, I ask you to please support those that support the OFH. In 2020, we launched the Catch the Ace Progressive Lottery, which is done totally online, and we were one of the first charities in Ontario to do so. We also ran a 50-50. Our OFH Conservation Lottery celebrated its 46th anniversary and helped to generate hundreds of thousands of dollars for our important conservation work. Monthly giving, calendars, uh, donation, one-time gifts to support the OFH cause and estate planning continue to be popular ways for donors to support conservation and also benefit from uh, tax deductions. OFH branding through the OFH Pro Shop considered to see huge successes as our members spend in excess of $110,000 on purchases on OFH branded merchandise. Our members are certainly proud to wave the OFH banner. Despite 2020 presenting many challenges due to the pandemic, you will hear shortly from our auditors at Grant Thornton that the OFH had a very good year. This was due in part to government COVID relief funds being made available, but we also continue to look for ways to operate our business as financially responsible as possible. We are con constantly looking for ways to cut costs without compromising the organization or the services that we offer our members and the outdoor community and our natural resources. I'm also pleased to report that in 2020, we received an Ontario Trillium Foundation grant for $63,000. This Resilient Communities Fund grant will help us rebuild and recover from impacts of COVID-19 by creating video conferencing spaces, by purchasing and installing network upgrades, video conferencing technology, and studio equipment to deliver uh, live stream in-class conservation education. Many upgrades have already been completed and will enable us to continue to work as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Unfortunately, because of time, I've only been able to provide you with a very brief synopsis of your Federation's undertakings and accomplishments. I encourage you to visit our website at www.ofh.org for more information, subscribe to e-news, e as well as utilize uh, social media. The OFH is one of Canada's largest fishing and hunting conservation organizations, and we have lots to share, lots to talk about, but more importantly, lots to be proud of. In closing, I would be remiss if I didn't give a huge shout out to our staff, our board of directors, partners, and of course, all of you uh, that have joined us here tonight and our members right across the province. Uh, your continued passion and dedication and putting your trust uh, in our organization has enabled us to accomplish the many things that we have. And for that, I say thank you, and I'll turn things back over to Rob.
Thanks, Angelo. Uh, great report. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, our, our auditor at this time, uh, Brad Collier, partner in Grant Thornton LLP. I've had the privilege of working with Grant and his crack staff for a couple of years now during my term as president, and uh, they are just incredible people to work with. So I'm going to turn it over now to Brad Collier, partner in uh, Grant Thornton LLP. Rob, Rob, if I may, I, I apologize, Rob. Uh, before we get to uh, uh, Brad, if we could get to um, uh, our uh, research grant winners, I'd like to give them an opportunity to talk, uh, introduce them and talk a little bit about their work uh, they're doing before we get to the auditor's report. No problem, Angel, go ahead, sorry. So, so thanks, Rob. So um, as I mentioned in uh, my report and uh, as uh, we have done uh, for many, many years, uh, the OFH is extremely uh, happy and pleased to uh, be able to uh, provide uh, research grants to uh, the next uh, generation of uh, wildlife managers. And we're pleased to, to have them join us here this evening. And I'd like to introduce them. And I'd also like to give them uh, 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 an opportunity to tell us a, a bit about themselves as well as uh, uh, the research work. So I'd like to start with uh, Shannon uh, Simpkins. Uh, Shannon uh, attends uh, Trent University. So I'll turn things over to Shannon. And uh, Shannon, please tell us about uh, the research you're doing. Sorry, has Shannon joined us? I apologize, folks. I, I I don't, uh, I don't uh, see Shannon there. So perhaps uh, we'll we'll go back to um, uh, to uh, Rob's original thoughts, and we'll go to uh, uh, Brad Collier of uh, Grant Thornton for our uh, auditor's report, and uh, we'll circle back to our grant uh, recipients. I apologize for that, Brad. Hi, Angelo. Hopefully everyone can hear me. It's uh, Brad Collier here from uh, Grant Thornton Chartered Accountants in Peterborough. And um, it's my pleasure this evening to uh, present um, the results of our audit and to review the financial statements with you. Um, I will also mention I'm also a hunter and a proud longtime member of your federation. I'm just going to touch on the highlights with you this evening. And the full financial statements are available on the Federation's website. The first two pages is our auditor's report, as you'll see on the screen. We start our audit with planning meetings and discussions with Federation management and the Finance Committee in the fall, with agreement of our audit plan in writing in December. We commenced our audit work at the beginning of February. Due to COVID restrictions, our work was mainly performed remotely this year with our audit team working from home. We set up a secure file sharing portal for management to upload our requested documents for us to retrieve. And most of our interviews and discussions were either done over the phone or by Zoom. We did attend the Federation's office on a couple of occasions when the volume of requested documents was too large to upload onto the portal and for certain audit procedures that required in-person observation. We completed our work in mid-March and we met with the Finance Committee to review the results of our audit on March 26, 2021, which you will see is the date at the bottom of the second page of our report. Um, in common with most charitable and not-for-profit organizations, our auditor's report does contain the standard qualification on the completeness of donation and fundraising revenues, but other than that, I am pleased to report it is a clean report. One item I would like to draw to your attention is there was a change in accounting policy for fiscal 2020 with respect to revenue recognition for capital contributions. This new accounting policy amortizes the revenue of donations received for the purchase of capital assets at the same rate as the amortization expense reported for the corresponding asset. 
This change in accounting policy was done retrospectively and resulted in a decrease in opening net assets for the year of 1.5 million with a corresponding increase in deferred capital contributions. As your auditors and with the agreement of Federation management and your board, we believe that this change in accounting policy better reflects the recognition of capital contributions in your financial statements. And now turning to the first page of numbers, uh, the statement of financial position, it shows your assets, liabilities and net assets of the Federation at the year end date, December 31st. The Federation continues to have a very strong financial position $4.3 million in cash and $1.9 million in investments and $1.1 million in other current assets. Liabilities include $900,000 of current trade payables and $2.2 million in deferred revenue. Net book value of capital assets is 1.5 million of which 1.3 million is represented by deferred capital contributions. So this leaves $4.3 million in unrestricted net assets. Turning to the next page of numbers, it's the statement of operations, and it shows the revenue and expenditures of the Federation for its fiscal year ended December 31st, 2020. Total revenues for 2020 were 9.8 million. This is an increase from 9.3 million in 2019. Membership did see a slight decline this year uh, and both membership revenue and expenses have decreased as more members are also opting for the online option, which is a discounted rate. There was also a decrease in program revenue and expenses as a number of programs did not take place this year as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But these decreases were offset by very strong fundraising and donations, particularly the very popular Catch the Ace campaign and also the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. The wage subsidy allowed the Federation to keep its staff gainfully employed throughout the pandemic and as a result, employee compensation costs are consistent and comparable to the previous year. Most staff have been working from home since last March, and as programs were canceled due to COVID restrictions, staff had to pivot and redeploy to other opportunities, but remain fully employed. The Ontario Out of Doors magazine did see decline in advertising revenues this year, which again can be attributed to the pandemic. But still, as you can see, the magazine continues to provide a very positive financial contribution to your Federation each year. As a result of the significant uncertainty surrounding the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, Federation management made many cost cutting decisions. And this resulted in a significant decrease in total expenditures during the year. And combined with the increase in overall revenues, it resulted in a surplus for the year of $1.1 million. This concludes my report. I'd like to express my appreciation to your board, uh, the management team and finance department at the Federation for all of their cooperation through this year's audit. And I will now pass it back to your president, Rob Hare, for any questions. Thank you, uh, Brad. I think that we're gonna deal with that in the chat and uh, we'll get back, if I'm not mistaken, Angelo, to people who have questions. No, if uh, if anybody has uh, okay. questions of uh, Brad's report while we have them, uh, perhaps we just let uh, Brad uh, answer those while he's still with us. I don't believe uh, I see uh, any questions. Great. Thanks, gentlemen. I well, think, thank uh, you, Brad. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate that, Rob. If uh, you would uh, call for uh, 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 call for um, a motion to accept um, uh, Brad's presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> With re, uh, before we do that, Angelo, uh, with respect to the voting privileges at the OFEH annual general meeting, as per the OFEH constitution and bylaw, page seven, 
voting at annual general meeting, all voting uh, at the annual general meeting shall be by paid up members in good standing. And to be a member of good standing constitutes a membership of 12 consecutive uh, months as a member and honorary members. So people that are not an OFAH good standing cannot vote. So move on to the motion. Therefore, be it moved that the auditor's report as presented by Brad Collier of Grant Thornton be accepted and that the audit of the OFAH financial statement for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2020 be approved. Moved by And we have a seconder. So would you please uh, signify by voting uh, yay or nay or abstain? Maybe we'll just give uh, people a few more uh, seconds, Rob, and then we can call the vote if you would, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll call that vote. And we have 96% in favor, uh, four abstained, and no one uh, voted nay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now our, we're going to, sorry, Angelo. No, sorry, Rob. But I think um, we're, we're going to try going back to our, um, uh, our uh, uh, grant recipients if we can. We'll, we'll give that another go. We apologize for that little technical glitch a moment ago, but um, I'd like to uh, uh, call upon the OFH zone. G Wildlife uh, Grant recipient, uh, Shannon uh, Sibkins. Uh, Shannon is uh, currently at uh, Trenton University and uh, we welcome and invite her to talk uh, a little bit about her research. So hopefully we can get Shannon to join us. Hello everyone, can you hear me okay now? Yes, thanks Shannon. Perfect, I'm so glad. So um, thanks for very much the introduction. Um, my name is Shannon Simpkins and I am from um, the Wildlife and Applied Genomics Lab at Trent University in Peterborough. And I'm studying white-tailed deer in Ontario. Uh, so first I'd like to express my deep gratitude for the support that the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters has provided for our wildlife research, uh, not only for their financial contribution, but for their ex expertise in, in working with their staff, including Keith Monroe, Mark Rickman, Matt DeMille and, and Jane Beggs, as well as all the other staff and members of, of OFA. Um, I'd also like to express our thanks to all the deer hunters and businesses like taxidermists and butchers, um, specifically the Beasley Brothers, Ralph's Butcher Shop in Norwood, um, that have worked with us to collect our deer data for the 2020 season. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in this area and I've always loved kind of the abundant wildlife in our waters, fields and forests. Um, I come from families that hunt and fish and I, I believe really strongly in working hard to protect those natural habitats through conservation management tools that are, are strongly rooted in sound scientific principles. Um, as you know, we talked about earlier tonight. Um, so one of the new tools in our toolbox has been analyzing populations through DNA. Um, so we're fortunate to have Aaron Schaefer's Wildlife and Applied Genomics Lab at Trent uh, that specializes in population analysis using genomics, so genetic and DNA uh, data. So some of the research we conduct at the lab looks at uh, deer population size and health of various regions across Ontario, as well as some of the stressors that the deer are facing. So things like chronic wasting disease that we talked about tonight, Lyme disease, um, invasive species, changes in climate and food availability. Um, so one of the, the tools that we can use, uh, antler growth, we're really interested in. Um, it's a criteria that we can use to assess uh, kind of health and fitness in a population. So one of the things we look at are, are typical and atypical antlers, um, antler size and, and length and number of points in the antlers. Uh, so I think we can all agree that deer are absolutely amazing creatures. Um, they grow antlers every year and there's a lot of energy that goes into that. Uh, so you may ask yourself kind of what goes into great antler growth. So some of it's uh, heredity, so what they're, you know, how, uh, what kind of they inherit from their parents and genetics. Um, some of it's nutrition, some of it's environmental factors like parasites and disease um, that can negatively affect them. Um, so one of the items we look at is, is the symmetry. So how 
uh, how equal the antlers are on the left and the right, and and of course size and and number of points, and that can give us clues to the health and fitness of the animals. Um, so we're also uh, looking for partners to help us collect samples for the upcoming hunting season from all over Ontario, uh, as it's only with a lot of sample numbers that we can begin to answer a lot of those questions about deer populations. Um, so we're happy to work with business operators that are um, great points of contact for a lot of deer samples coming in. Um, we love butchers, taxidermists, outfitters, um, and we're also happy to work with individual hunters. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give a shout out for that. Uh, if you're interested, if you can contact us, that'd be great. Um, we're typically looking for a lot of basic information about antlers. So we're looking at tooth um, growth. So, so hunters that helped us last year, um, if they wanted to give me their contact information, we could help uh, age those teeth. So we need an incisor that we can get a, an age on, on the tooth. And we can get rough estimates from the, the, the back teeth. Um, a tiny little piece of muscle for DNA um, and preferably the length of their hind foot uh, that we can look at comparisons for, for growth and age. Um, and preferably the, the wildlife management unit where the deer was harvested. Um, so as the Honourable Minister stated, we need healthy populations to have healthy hunting. And, uh, and he was at Trent University where they were doing CWD testing. And it's through studies like this that we can um, establish some baseline data for understanding deer populations. Um, one of the other items we're interested in is deer movement. Uh, of course, some areas, especially around borders, are at high risk for CWD. So, so our lab uh, is interested in that as well. Um, as a point of discussion in the chat, some of the best conservationists are hunters and you know, we need that communicated to the public. So just a couple of final words, um, we need your help to better understand these issues in Ontario. Um, hunters are welcome to leave their contact information with me um, if they wanna know the age of the deer for anybody that works with us. Um, so if you'd like to know, um, I can be reached at Trent University, our extension number is 6612. And I'm hoping we can get some contact information in an upcoming uh, OFA publication. So I. I would really appreciate your help for that. Um, so thanks so much to OFA for all your help and uh, and especially for the opportunity to speak tonight. I really appreciate it. That's uh, wonderful, uh, Shannon. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for that, and uh, we wish you the best uh, with your with your uh, research. And again, thank you for uh, the support of OFH uh, Zone G. Uh, the OFH Zone Age uh, Zone H Fisheries uh, Grant recipient is uh, Christian uh, Terrian, and uh, uh, Christian is from the University of Waterloo. So welcome, Christian, and thank you for being here with us. Hey, can you hear me? Sure can, thank you. Oh, perfect. So I got to say, I'm honored to be the recipient of the Zone H Fisheries Research Grant and help carry out the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters uh, mandate to help support fish conservation and help restore native fishes. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a lifelong avid hunter, angler, and currently in a trapper's apprentice. In fact, I like fishing so much, I uh, try to make a living out of it. I did my undergrad and master's theses uh, at the University of Western Ontario, where I studied projects related to Atlantic salmon conservation and restoration in, in Lake Ontario with our Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters partner. So I was a part of that uh, Bring Back the Salmon program. I gotta say it's a great program. After this, uh, I, got, I got a job as a fish culture technician with the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources at the Dorian Fish Culture Station in Dorian, Ontario. Um, before returning to do my PhD at the University of Waterloo, where I'm also co-supervised by a uh, supervisor, Brian Neff, at Western University. So I split my time between the two universities. The project I'll be carrying out with the, the funds of the Zone H Fisheries Research Grants is a part of a larger uh, project series uh, that comprises my PhD thesis and a number of other uh, 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 areas of interest for the Great uh, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, looking at uh, the effects of invasive species on lake trout restoration uh, in Ontario. This specific program looks to examine the prevalence of thiamine deficiency among lake trout strains stocked into Lake Ontario. The so lake trout were once the apex predator uh, in Lake Ontario alongside Atlantic salmon, but were functionally extirpated uh, at, the of, at the end of the 1800s. And today there's actually still no self-sustaining populations in Lake Ontario. One of the major factors hypothesized to obstruct these efforts is the abundance of exotic prey, specifically rainbow smelt and alewife in the Great Lakes. So unlike native prey, these species contain high levels of the enzyme thiaminase, which breaks down vitamin B1 or thiamine. The consumption has been associated with thiamine deficiency in many Great Lake salmon, including Atlantic salmon. Thiamine deficiency, also known as beriberi in humans, um, has se severe fitness consequences for these animals, uh, for afflicted animals, such as low survival, low growth, 
and low egg survival. So there's actually intergenerational effects. Thus, it's hypothesized that thymine deficiency is a major factor hindering lake trout reintroduction success in Lake Ontario. Previous work out of the NEF lab um, on Atlantic salmon identified differences between different strains uh, of Atlantic salmon to this dietary thymonase uh, because of local adaptations, and which indicates selecting some strains with a tolerance to thymine could help increase the effectiveness of restoration programs. This hasn't been done in lake trout, despite several strains potentially possessing a local adaptation to dietary thymonates. For example, the Seneca Lake strain from New York State um, has a long history with alewife, so it could be considered uh, thymonase tolerant, whereas the Lake Superior strains um, never suffered a large scale alewife uh, invasion, so it could thus be considered thymonase vulnerable. So I'm I will compare the prevalence of thymine deficiency among lake about these two lake trout strains stocked in the Lake Ontario. Beginning this summer, uh, adult lake trout will be collected from Lake Ontario um, with our ministry partners through uh, the routine gill net index sampling, along as angling. So I'll be out in the water uh, doing some fishing and through angler donations. And again, just like Shannon, um, we're, we're gonna put some contact information hopefully in a, in a, in a recent publication to see if you guys uh, wanna get involved. Um, so with these collected fish, we can take a muscle sample and actually determine their th th like tissue thymine levels. And from there, determine if they're thymine deficient or not. Um, we can also identify to th them the strain using genetic tools. So the folks at the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources Forestry at DNA Lab, at actually at Trent University, um, they have a long history of doing this kind of work, strain identification. So they're gonna be helping us, uh, out, us out with that. So then we can relate the the prevalence of thymine deficiency to the different strains. And from there, we can see if some strains have a higher performance and are better candidates for lake trout reintroduction um, in Lake Ontario than others. So the results of this project are, are gonna help with lake trout conservation, um, not only in Lake Ontario, but across the whole province um, and helping in, increase the number of lake trout, uh, hopefully um, in the province. So, so there'll be more fishing opportunities. Um, with that, I just wanna say again, thanks again to uh, to, to everybody at the Ontario Federation of Anglers. Don't know if I mentioned it before, but I'm a, I'm a member and uh, happy to see uh, science-based conservation management. And I, I gotta say, I'm a, a proud to be a member. And, and with that, back to you, Angelo. Thanks again. That's great. Thanks again, uh, Christian. And um, uh, best of luck with uh, your, your research. And obviously, if there's anything we can ever do to, to help, please uh, feel free to, to reach out to us. Again, thanks for joining us. I'd like to now uh, introduce you to the uh, OFAH, uh, Dave Ankney, Sandy Johnson uh, Award for Avian Ecology uh, recipient, and uh, Darius uh, Wadashuk. And uh, Darius, I apologize if I've mispronounced your name, but um, I will get it right eventually, I promise. So uh, welcome and uh, thanks for uh, being here. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. So um, my name is Darius Wojtaszek, uh, definitely a mouthful. Um, but I'm sure you'll get it eventually. As soon as you get it, you'll never forget it. Um, that's what I found. So first off, I'd like to say how honored I am to be receiving this grant. Um, I've been a member with the OFAH for a little under a year now. Um, so a little, so I'm very um, honored to be able to receive this generous support not only from an organization that's representing anglers and hunters, but also having these science-based conversations and protecting these natural resources that all Ontario um, residents can take part in. So a little bit about me, I am born and raised in London, Ontario. Uh, I did my undergrad at Western. I don't have a lot of hunting and fishing experience behind me. Um, it wasn't very prevalent in my family. And I wasn't very um, wildlife ecology driven coming into university, but uh, now as a graduate student, I've definitely worked, I'm working towards uh, wildlife ecology and conservation. Um, so my research mainly deals with applying different intrinsic markers to the conservation and management of waterfowl species. 
So in particular, the species of interest for me is northern pintails. So these, this is a species of interest for conservationists, just simply due to it being consistently below long-term management goals. Uh, and a lot, there's been a lot of questions as to why that um, that's the case. So in terms of using intrinsic markers, um, we are looking at using stable isotopes to help inform current pintail management. There's a very long and rich history of waterfowl management in North America through the use of aerial ground surveys in spring, um, a lot of banding effort, but a lot of areas are simply infeasible to be surveying. So Northern areas, um, which constitute a large area of the pintails breeding range. So we are fortunate enough to be getting feather samples from the kind of National Park Survey, um, which Canadians send in the clipped wings from, from the ducks that they've shot for aging and sexing. And we can actually use the feathers and the high, the isotope ratios within those feathers to then inform us where that feather was grown and in turn where the breeding areas are. So especially in terms of Ontario and in Eastern Canada, there hasn't been a lot of previous literature in terms of where these birds that are being shot are being produced. So we are applying a variety of isotope ratios. So hydrogen isotopes will be able to tell us where that feather was grown on a coarse scale. Uh, we will also be using carbon and nitrogen isotope ratios to provide an idea of the environment in which that feather was grown. To essentially establish these stable isotope techniques as another way to have monitoring of these hunted populations. It's important that we know which birds are being produced where in order to make sure that we're not over harvesting certain areas. So a lot of conservation applications to my work. And again, thank you to all the hunters out there that are participating in these part surveys. Um, it's a very critical portion of a lot of my research and a lot of other people's research. And again, thank you to the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters for uh, supporting me and my work. And hopefully together we can find out what's going on with these pintails, um, not only in Ontario, but across Canada. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And again, thank you to all our um, research grant uh, recipients. Um, we certainly uh, support to the work uh, we're doing. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, if there's anything we can do to uh, help, we have uh, staff uh, here that uh, are willing to uh, help out any way we can. We also uh, are, are fortunate to uh, have uh, Kyle Davis uh, with us here this evening. Kyle is the recipient of the OFH Fleming College uh, Fish and Wildlife Scholarship Award. So welcome, call, uh, welcome, uh, Kyle. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Davis, and I'm this year's recipient of the OFH Fleming College Fish and Wildlife Scholarship Award. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Angelo Lombardo. Uh, when I received your letter, I was obviously uh, very excited and very honored to have been selected this year. And it came at a time where uh, school was starting to get tough, and we were really grinding through the third year at Fleming College. So it helped provide that extra motivation in which. Uh, you know, I could kind of use, use to catapult myself to get through uh, the rest of the school that was coming up. So thank you very much. Um, to give you some background on who I am, I was born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, I've been an angler just about as long as I can remember. I have some pretty distinct memories of uh, practicing casting my fishing rod at about the age of four in my parents' front yard. Uh, when we weren't out fishing, when my dad didn't take me out fishing, I'd be practicing trying to become a better angler. So it's been a long, uh, for a long time in my life, it's been an important part about who I am. Uh, Education-wise, I first graduated from Niagara College and I started a career in the field of engineering consulting. Uh, I did that for a number of years. And in 2018, I decided I wanted to try and switch career paths and try and align uh, you know, my career more, more in line with what I like to do in my free time, which was fishing. So something I could do outdoors and be closer to those spaces and places that I'd grown to love. Um, so I enrolled in Fleming College and uh, back in 2018, and I'm currently just trying to finish up my first year there now. 
Uh, since enrolling, I found employment as an aquatic biologist working for a company called Natural Resource Solutions. Uh, Solutions. I've uh, been employed as a fisheries lab assistant at Fleming. And more recently, I've been employed as a wildlife research technician for the Ministry of Natural Resources. So uh, the decision to come back to school has definitely paid off. It's put me in some very interesting places and spaces, and uh, it's been a very rewarding and enjoyable experience. Um, if there's one thing I did learn at Fleming thus far, it's that education is a lifelong process. Uh, so for this reason, um, I plan to continue my education and hopefully enroll in university this coming fall or sometime in the near future. And uh, this scholarship from the OFAH will play a, a large role in helping me to ob obtain those academic goals. Um, so just to wrap it up in summation, I want to say thank you to Angelo again. Uh, I sincerely appreciate the support and, and helping keep me motivated and accountable for my, my studies and my grades. Uh, Matt DeMille, Chris Robinson, Jane Beggs, all from the OFAH for uh, their participation in the selection process. And uh, from Fleming College, Paul, Paul Ashley and Erica Carter, uh, who are also involved in that process. Paul Ashley is a teacher there and he's been a great uh, teacher and mentor to me. And just for, on a personal note, I want to thank the OFAH um, as an angler. Uh, during the last year, obviously things have changed a lot. And um, as an angler and, and having some free time as things started to close down at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, it was up in the air whether there was going to be a fishing season. And um, your guys' updates, Angelo mentioned there was about uh, you know a million website updates and uh, probably a large portion of those were for me because I looked to you guys during that pandemic for, uh, uh, for guidance to see you know what was open, what was available, what we could do safely, what we were legally allowed to do. So um, not only does the OFAH provide uh, you know, input to, to how to manage our fisheries and things like that. You're also getting that information out to anglers. So I'm proud to say I'm a new member. And uh, even as a non-member before, you guys helped, uh, you know, keep me informed and, and keep me aware of opportunities for angling around the province. So um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope to make you guys proud of the scholarship. And uh, I look forward to hopefully getting to know some of you guys better and uh, continue to have some ongoing interactions with the OFAH. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kyle, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the, the kind words uh, and uh, the best of luck uh, with your continuing education. Thank you so much. Uh, we've also had, uh, over the course of uh, the years, the opportunity to provide uh, internship uh, internships, and uh, these internships are four months long. Um, the uh, successful candidates uh, work uh, along side our um, biologists, our professionals here at uh, head office, and they and they just gain a, a wealth of uh, information and knowledge that uh, will help them as they uh, seek uh, employment within the uh, the outdoors uh, world. Uh, we like to call them the next generation of uh, fish and uh, wildlife um, uh, managers. So I would like to uh, take this opportunity now to uh, introduce uh, Johnny Nene. Johnny is uh, our OFH Finn Simmons Financial group fish and wildlife intern and uh, Johnny joined us uh, back first of the new year I believe his first day was uh, January 4 so uh, welcome Johnny hello hi thanks thanks Angelo hi everybody um, as Angelo said I'm the uh, OFH Fitzsimmons Financial Group fish and wildlife conservation intern um, quite the title there um, just a little bit about myself, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I'm a life, lifelong angler, like many people here. Um, recently, I've got some pretty good steelheading tips from my buddy, Kyle Davis. So good to see you, man. Um, I'm a uh, 2020 graduate from Fleming College uh, Fish and Wildlife Program. And while I was at Fleming, you know, I learned the foundations of fish and wildlife management, as well as um, current uh, industry surveying techniques. Um, I want to thank uh, Fitzsimmons Financial Group for sponsoring my internship. You know, it's been uh, an incredibly valuable and rewarding experience thus far. And um, I, I greatly appreciate Fitzsimmons' willingness to uh, invest in aspiring professionals like myself, because um, it's not always easy to get into this field. So thank you. Um, my time with OFAH is uh, coming to an end uh, rather quickly. Uh, and I've been involved in uh, a variety of interesting projects so far. Um, uh, I've had the privilege of sitting in on um, various advisory committee meetings, including the Fisheries Advisory Committee and Big Game Committee, um, as well as um, Community Hatchery and Alternative Land Use Services meetings. Um, and that's been really, really cool to get some insight into the inner workings and the relationships within the OFH and other organizations. And um, as a member, um, 
it's encouraging to know just how much work the OFH is doing behind the scenes that people don't get to see. Um, so that's been interesting. And on the, on the kind of more technical side of my work with OFH, uh, I've created a couple technical reports, including a legislation scan on the use of drones for hunting, uh, as well as a literature review on the efficacy of deer whistles at uh, preventing deer vehicle collisions. And uh, both Chris Robinson and Keith Monroe have been uh, incredible mentors for me through these projects, um, as well as others. Um, so thanks guys for, for your help with those. And um, another big initiative has been uh, my role with um, the virtual classroom hatchery program. Um, and I've worked really closely with Ben Teske and Catherine Pyman to film segments for the virtual classroom hatchery episodes that uh, we're uploading weekly. Um, I've also um, gathered a bunch of resources and compiled, uh, compiled them into a couple spreadsheets for um, the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. Uh, currently, I'm working with uh, Keith Monroe to develop a wildlife disease fact sheet and uh, that's gonna get some uh, uh, input from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. So that's coming along uh, quite nicely. Um, yeah, so I just, I also wanna thank the OFH for everything I've learned and experienced during my internship. You know, despite the COVID pandemic, I've made some real meaningful connections with the OFH and, um, it's evident that the organization is continuing to press forward with important initiatives despite everything. And um, I'm just happy to have played a small part in that. So uh, thanks everybody. Um, it's, it's been a real great experience thus far. Great, uh, thanks Johnny. And thanks for taking the time to, uh, to join us. Uh, we know time goes by fast. I remember it was just January 4th and now we're already into to April. But uh, again, uh, we hope that uh, your time here and the experiences will, will help you uh, ultimately uh, land that, uh, that uh, uh, permanent job in resource management somewhere. So we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to uh, call upon our OFH BrokerLink Fish and Wildlife uh, intern, uh, Alex uh, Marund. Alex. Good evening, how are you? So I just wanna say, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to come on here and talk a little bit about myself and to be able to participate in this annual uh, general meeting this year. A uh, bit about myself. Um, like many of us growing up, I had a mentor who kind of showed me the ropes as far as angling and hunting. For me, that was my father. He really played a strong role in the development of my passion and helped me foster a sense of responsibility for the conservation of Ontario's fish and wildlife. I kind of started out like many of us with like a worm, bobber and a hook fishing off the dock for sunfish. But since then I've continued to develop that passion and consider myself to be a multi-species angler and I do participate in sustainable and ethical hunting practices in, in the province. Uh, all this memories and these experiences really inspired me to pursue a career in fish and wildlife. And I started my post-secondary education at Sir Sanford Fleming College. I participated in the three-year fish and wildlife technologist program and have since graduated, but it has taught me a lot about fish, wildlife and their habitats and has really exposed me to a lot of the professors, uh, professionals in the industry and a lot of my colleagues within this field. Um, one work opportunity that I've experienced through my schooling was my opportunity to work with the Harkness Laboratory of Fisheries Research. Uh, during this, I got to work within Algonquin Provincial Park and assess the fish populations within here for their abundance, occurrence, and uh, also their, their dispersion within these inland lakes. It's one of these experiences that has really solidified my ideals about pursuing a career with fish and wildlife, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that OFH has given me that I can go forward and develop these uh, skills that I've built on uh, within my schooling. 
at this time, I just want to touch on my uh, sincerest gratitude to the Broker Link Incorporated for funding this internship with OFAH and allowing young professionals like myself the opportunity to continue developing the necessary knowledge and skills within the natural resource sector to make a full on career at it. And then just in conclusion, I just want to thank everyone once again for allowing me uh, the chance to come on here, speak a little bit about myself, and I really am looking forward to working with the OFAH. Well, that's uh, that's uh, great, and uh, thanks, uh, Alex. And we certainly uh, wish you the, the the best of luck. Uh, and again, uh, thanks to um, uh, Zones and all our sponsors for making these uh, research grants and these internships uh, possible. Uh, it's certainly uh, a worthwhile uh, venture, as you heard, uh, and it certainly uh, gives uh, opportunity for that next generation of wildlife manager to continue with their work, but uh, also get some valuable work experience. So again, thanks to, uh, to everyone. So I would like to uh, turn things uh, back over to uh, Rob. Um, uh, here to um, introduce um, uh, our next order of uh, business on the agenda. Rob. Thanks, Angelo. So now we're going to hear from a financial overview from our financial chief financial officer, Steve Doris. So Steve, could you provide us with the financial overview, please? Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Um, I would just like to take a short moment to uh, provide a quick update on our operations as we've moved into 2021. Uh, as you've just heard, the Federation did complete 2020 on a sound financial footing. Uh, however, we do not consider ourselves completely out of the woods just yet. Planning for 2021 has required us to make many assumptions and prepare for many possible contingencies. Uh, for example, our 2021 budget does not include any revenue or expenses for many of our youth activities. Although opportunities appear to be fading, we do have funds set aside in case an opportunity does present itself towards the end of the year. Uh, your Federation continues to monitor government programs and opportunities, as well as adjust operations to the changing regulations around COVID-19. As you have heard, we continue to invest to make sure that staff working from home can remain both productive and engaged. With only two months officially in the 2021 books, it's a little early to draw inferences from or read trends into the numbers. However, I can report that the Federation is off to a good start, similar to what we see at this year uh, similar to what we see most years at this time. Uh, while many youth programs are on hold, we have made inroads when opportunities present itself. Our NASP program has trained members of the DND base in Borden uh, to be NASP trainers, and the goal of this is to bring the NASP program to 30 northern communities. In 2021, we are also hoping to relaunch our Invading Species Hit Squad program, which will reach many areas of the province. Uh, we should know shortly uh, whether the funding will be available for this program. And of course, we will be monitoring other restrictions as we move into the summer. As you have heard, our online paperless memberships continue to grow along, to grow along with the new additional paperless plus membership option. These memberships greatly reduce the hard copy and administrative costs related to both the memberships and the overall renewal process. We continue to see increase in members making use of our monthly giving option which purchases or membership while making additional donations available to the organization. The Federation has recently launched another round of Catch the Ace. These proceeds allow us to fund all aspects of conservation work, research, education, outreach, and project assistance when required. Obviously, school visits to the Mario Cordelucci Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center continue to be on hold. However, as with many parts of our operation, we, are develop we have developed and are providing online learning opportunities. Many of our other programs, such as ISAP, Atlantic Salmon Restoration, and Tackle Share are also working with online programming. The Federation has invested to provide better online experiences and engagement for our members. The latest online information forms regarding moose tag allocations and firearm legislations is just two examples of where we have received positive feedback. So in closing, I would like to reiterate, while the Federation continues to invest in many conservation projects, we do remain vigilant to ensure we maximize the resources that we've been entrusted with. And I will pass it back to our President Rob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve, that was very good. Uh, I'm gonna move on. I have a motion to read to you. Um, a motion for the appointment of auditors. Therefore, be it moved that the chartered accountant firm of Grant Thornton and Peterborough 
Ontario, be appointed the auditors for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, Inc. for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2021. Moved by, and we have a seconder. Could you please vote on that? Yay, nay, or abstain? Leave that up for just another minute and then we will close that. Okay, let's close that and we'll get a result of the vote. And again, 92% in favor and eight abstain. So that passed, thank you very much. I have another motion to read um, and it's the ratification of business. And I'd be very honest with you, I've read this a number of times with different meetings and it's a tongue twister. So please forgive me if I foul it up, but we'll go back over it. Therefore, be it moved that all acts, contracts, bylaws, proceedings, appointments, elections, payments enacted, made, done or undertaken by the board of directors, staff and officers of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, Inc since the last annual general meeting to date hereof as the same set out or ratified in the minutes of the meeting of the board of directors or in the financial statement and reports submitted to this meeting be and the same are hereby, hereby ratified, approved, sanctioned and confirmed. And we have a mover on that. And we have a seconder and would you please vote? We'll leave that up just for a minute longer. Okay, we'll close that. And again, 90% in favor, 10 abstained, so that is passed. So we're, we're really closing down here, which is great, because I know I want to thank everyone for staying on with us. We still have a number of participants, which is fantastic. Um, despite the profound changes, and in the face of incredible uncertainty, OFAH members should be absolutely proud of what we've accomplished. It's truly remarkable. And I would like to thank my colleagues on the board of directors and the advisory committees who volunteer considerable time and energy, our staff who tackle impossible workloads to help create a better fishing and hunting future and to our members who continue to support this important work. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to work with each and every one of you during my two incredibly rewarding terms as president of this great organization. I wanted, uh, in closing, I wanna ask everyone to please follow the provincial guidelines, stay safe, stay healthy and wash your hands. Thank you. And we've got one more piece of business to do. And again, it's another, uh, uh, it's um, a, a motion to uh, adjourn. Therefore be it moved that we adjourn the OFH annual general meeting on Thursday, April the 21st at 9.14 PM. I have a mover and a seconder. Would you please vote?
And we'll close that vote now. 99% in favor. Thank you very much. Everyone have a good night. Stay safe and enjoy yourselves. Be careful out there. Um, if you're going um, turkey hunting this year, be safe. And if you're going fishing for trout, be safe also. Thank you. Enjoy. And thank you for participating tonight. It's been incredibly great to have this many people attend our annual. Gym.